All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. You can continue to introduce yourself in the chat. We're so excited that you're here. Make sure you share with everybody else where you're coming from um, and what your word is to describe strategic planning. My name is Andrea Getches, or Drea. I'm an associate partner with Education Elements. Um, prior to being at EE, I was a special education teacher and coach. Um, and just really excited about uh, sharing what we've learned along the way about strategic planning. I think in the different roles that I've played, I've seen the impact of strategy and how it can help uh, you know, ease decision making and uh, help us pivot in, in new ways. So just really excited to, to share some of this information with you. And um, I'll pass it over to Shelby to introduce yourself too. Hi everyone, Shelby here. Uh, I'm joining you from Austin, Texas. So hi to the Austin crowd. I see we've got some Houston. It looks like maybe Grand Prairie joining us. Um, I am a managing partner at Education Elements and like Drea have done quite a bit of strategic planning. I'm actually in the middle of some pretty um, big strategic planning projects here in Texas as we speak. Uh, but I love this work. I love the, the strategy type of consulting. Uh, I'm also a researcher by trade. I um, Prior to coming to Education Elements, uh, I did some research-based consulting and then actually worked in education policy for several years at the Center on Education Policy in DC. Um, that was what I did after I left the classroom, but I got my start in education as a teacher in North Texas. So uh, it's been a, a fun kind of professional journey, but that role as a, a researcher, I think, um, it marries nicely with this strategy work. And so I'm looking forward to this conversation today, specifically uh, because it, I think, gets us into that marriage between data and strategy, which is a really fun kind of place for me to play. So happy to be here. Thanks, Drea. Um, so many of you who are here are probably familiar with us, but um, for those of you who are new to education elements, would love to share a little bit about us. Um, we're in an education consultancy committed to transforming schools and districts, as you can see. Um, we just turned 10, uh, which was very exciting for us. Um, we work with thousands of districts across the country, but I think the things that we're most proud of are um, the deep relationships that we build. So you see um, most of the folks we work with come back. Um, for, for more work. And I think that just speaks to the incredible work that we see in the relationship building that we have. Um, <clears throat> and the last piece I share, because I think it's kind of a commitment to you all, we get really positive feedback on our workshops. Um, and this is, we hope to be no different. So along the way, if there's something that you're interested in learning, you have questions, want to know more, please feel free to share in the chat. Um, we wanna make sure that this meets your needs. Um, Another a few things, so we've, uh, if you've worked with us before, you might know the different ways in which we engage with folks. So um, we started in blended and personalized learning. Today we'll be talking about strategic planning, but also wanted to share some of the different avenues um, in which we enter districts. So uh, we did a lot of pivoting in the last summer and we're thinking about it again this summer to return to school in the midst of the pandemic. Um, equity, leadership work, teacher retention, and um, just our team and culture work. So if there's anything else that, that's top of mind for you and your community, these are other uh, service, services that we provide um, and there will certainly be more webinars and uh, you know, information coming that, uh, through uh, the pipeline that we'll talk about a bit more at the end of the webinar. So definitely more opportunities for you to learn and grow with more people on our team. Um, so I want to talk a bit about our strategic planning approach, because that's why we're here today. Um, we're talking about what makes it different or really our, our stamp. What do we think is important when strategic planning in organizations? Um, so I want to talk a bit about why we think it's important. I think traditionally what happens is we have brought people together to, or to a small group of people to create a plan and then we try and invest folks. So we try and get our community invested and um, that's worked in the past. And I think uh, to some extent, you know, there's a, it's a focus on getting the work done before we roll it out. But really what we wanna change our strategic planning approach or mindset to be is that we invest and create at the same time. So it's not like you're introducing a completely new plan because you've invested your stakeholders and your community along the way. Um, we think that leads to 
uh, your plans actually being used rather than collecting dust on a shelf and um, leads to some really transformative changes in your communities. And we do that through responsive planning. So this is just kind of a collection of, of different definitions that we use, but responsive planning is developing a plan that prioritizes the process over the product. So this actually helps you to sustain your plan, to adapt it to meet your needs and then make pivots. So how do you make changes along the way that respond to the changing needs within your community. And we're gonna talk about a few examples of that throughout this time. Um, and a lot of that is really based in how you're collecting information. <clears throat> and last few things I wanna share about why we think this is so important is that um, a few different things happen when you engage in responsive planning. We think you bring folks in um, and many perspectives are brought in, are consult uh, instead of being consulted for feedback, they're included not just in providing feedback, but in creating some of the, the solutions. So we also provide time for feedback, but also time to design. Um, it really creates high building and it makes sure that people are working together throughout, which really lays an incredible groundwork for ongoing work. Um, we also find that in prioritizing sprints or short periods of time of planning allows for people to, to pivot and become more responsive. And then finally, I think this, this goes without saying, but I think it's important to, to underscore that clear communication, constant communication allows you to integrate your beliefs. And I think all of this will be highlighted today. And um, you know, once you have a plan, how you will transform it. Um, so really we wanna see, uh, wanna share a little bit about how the different layers of the of our team or of our organization impact one another. So we believe that responsive classrooms are at the center of our work. Uh, there are leaders who support those classrooms. So teachers, school leaders, district leaders, they all um, ensure that students are getting what they need in the classroom. And they become parts of responsive teams. So all of these groups are working together in a way that responds to new and changing information. And that kind of leads to it being in the water, in the culture of your um, organization. And really the outcomes or the things that we see change are on the right. So when you when your procedures change, they become sturdy, but they become adaptable. Your teams become agile, but also aligned. Um, your leaders become really resilient and uh, apt to innovate. And then finally, your classrooms are, your teachers are really opened up to respond to strengths and needs. So um, just a little bit of context on strategic planning, why we think it's so important and why uh, the shift to responsive planning. And today we wanna talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, so here are our goals for today. Thanks, Drea. I can talk us through these. So uh, I mentioned in my introduction that today is kind of a fun um, conversation for me, particularly because we get to intersect the data conversation with the strategic planning conversation. So that's our goal. Number one is to consider the role of data specifically in this especially responsive type of strategic planning that that Drea just described to you guys. Um, and we want to identify some ways that data can make your current strategic initiatives or if you're working on a strategic plan, how the use of information and data can actually make it more responsive. And then our goal also is to highlight some examples of best practices or um, some actual case studies where we've seen this, this work really well. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to kind of jump in to, to talk about traditional versus responsive strategic planning a little bit more, especially when it comes to uh, data specifically and the role of data in a strategic plan. You've heard us, heard us say this uh, phrase responsive a lot at this point, but it is exactly what it sounds like, that we want to build a plan that is, is able to be agile and consistently responding to changing needs, changing environments. It's something that we have believed strongly in long before the events of 2020 and 2021, but we've, you know, we've never experienced um, even you know, more than we have the past couple of years, how important that kind of planning can be. 
Um, so when it comes to data, traditionally, oftentimes, you see data being used in, as kind of a summative measure. Uh, you'll have a strategic plan and then data are added on to the end to say, okay, these are the specific ways that we are going to determine whether or not we met our goals, whether or not we succeeded or we didn't. So it's this evaluative thing that happens at the end of a plan or, or maybe even at the end of a year of each of the plan. But when we look at that in a more responsive way, we're actually using data as more of a formative measure in a couple of ways. One, we use it to understand the extent to which we're making consistent progress. So it's not just the success at the end, but rather as we go, are we seeing the indicators we want to see that we're going to have that impact that we originally planned? Um, and then if not, is there a pivot point there? Is there a pivot point in our strategy? Do we actually need a different plan at this point because something else has changed? Um, so the role of data there is different and kind of a good way to summarize that, um, it's actually on the next slide, Andrea, is um, thinking about, when you think about data and how it should be used in your strategic planning process, it's not the end goal there, that it's something we use to continue to refine our, our approach. We believe that a, the planning process is ongoing and it's something you continue to learn from, but you can only learn from it if you have new information. And so that, that data collection process, the data review, the data conversations are something that is used throughout the process. So I'm gonna dig into this a little bit more and give you guys some examples so you can really start digging your hands into this um, some of you may have used or, or heard about the use of a theory of action when it comes to strategic planning. It's this idea that you are ahead of time when you're identifying a strategy, you're going ahead and planning out why you feel like that strategy is the right one. You have a theory that you're putting in place here, a theory of what is going to actually happen if you make this decision. In a traditional kind of strategic plan that might have a theory of action, you usually see these two parts. You see the set of practices that I'm kind of pointing to on the left hand side of my screen, initiatives in your plan, the, the decisions that you're making, the key actions, this is what we're going to do. And then from, a, again, a summative viewpoint, you've got um, some desired outcomes that you're, you're going to measure. Maybe it's an impact on students, maybe it's an impact on staff, an impact on your community. But when we take a more responsive look at that, there's this middle bucket that we want to include in our strategic plan in our theory of action specifically. And those are kind of midterm results. Um, there are things that happen in between those two um, uh, uh, points on the um, axis here, like the decision that we make to include this initiative, the outcome we're hoping to see. We want to include in our theory of action what we think might happen in between those and have some really intentional plans and, and I think um, ways for measuring those, those results that we see in between those two. I'm gonna unpack that a little bit more and because I think there's actually a continuum here. There's lots of different things that happen in the middle that are worth attaching some data to and considering when you're building out your plan. So I would say the very first thing is fidelity. If you make a decision around a program you want to include in your strategic plan around an initiative, it's really important that you measure that it's actually happening as you intended. Um, for example, if you decide you're going to build in personalized learning practices into your classrooms, you invest in a lot of teacher training, um, you want to measure first and foremost, is it actually happening? Is the initiative as the way you planned it actually being executed? Um, in the way that you intended or in the way that you planned. So that's kind of the first part of the continuum. Then we get into, okay, if the if it is you know happening as we planned, is there some effectiveness here that we're seeing? Are we actually seeing the changes that we hope to see or that we defined in our theory of action? And if so, then we can start getting into impact. And there's probably some near-term impact, some midterm and some long-term impact um, measures that we can build into our plan. Let me um, kind of take you through, as you can imagine, I think I've worded this in kind of like a decision tree type of way. So I'm going to like walk you through that process here. Um, this is something we just recently added because we found as we were talking to districts about it or explaining it, it became a yes or no type conversation. So we're still playing with this language, but I think this visual kind of helps. So as I mentioned on that continuum, often the very first question is, are our initiatives being implemented as intended? 
And if the answer is no, then it's definitely worth figuring out why not. Is there something we need to improve just in terms of how we're implementing something? Is it an implementation challenge or is there something else there? But obviously we have to figure that out before we can get to any other part of our, our plan or our, our theory of action here. But if the answer is yes, yes, we're actually seeing it's being implemented as we planned. The next question is, are the changes then producing some desired short-term um, effects? The answer may be no. So going back to that personalized learning um, example, if we're, we were hoping that doing that, we would start seeing maybe kids making more decisions for themselves about their own learning, taking more ownership or advocacy about their own learning. If we're not seeing that, the question is, is this still the right priority? Are there other things? So for example, maybe kids are coming back into your classrooms for the first time in a year and a half. And maybe there's a lot of social and emotional challenges there or relationships that have to be built before we can even get to this place of student advocacy. There might be a pivot point there that's really important um, to identify and to react to before you double down on your initial plan of digging really deeply and committing really deeply to student advocacy or, or personalized learning. Um, I'm not saying that's the right decision there, but using it as an example that, you know, maybe there's an adjustment in your approach based on the changing kind of context and environment around you. Or maybe the answer is yes. Yes, we're actually seeing some indicators that this is producing some short-term, mid-term um, changes that we were hoping to see. And um, then the question becomes, so are there long-term sustained changes in the specific target population you were hoping to see? Yes, great, wonderful. This has this theory of action, this theory that you articulated for you and your team is coming true and this ex is exactly what you, you want to see. If not, no, if not, then the question again becomes why not? And there's more conversations to be had there. So again, as you can tell, this is, it's, um, it's, I don't wanna say difficult, but there are a lot of layers of conversations here that are easily skipped over because it requires more socialization. It's conversations that happen in your teams, which we're gonna talk about in a second, that really should be happening in an ongoing way rather than setting a plan and then revisiting it again a year later or worse, even three years later without having these interim conversations and, and looking at the data to kind of check how it's all working out. So I'm gonna take a step back from this and tell you a story uh, that can hopefully help you connect what we, I just shared with you and sort of a real life example. So uh, this little boy, this is my son, Miles. He is a second grader. And like most people across the country, we started second grade remotely this year. And uh, my husband and I work full time. And so we've also got a, a younger boy who is in uh, pre-K right now. So this was a huge adjustment for us. You know, we are used to getting our kids ready to school or for school, taking them to school. And then my husband goes to an office. You know, I'm sometimes at home, sometimes not at home. And so for all of us to be home all the time, some of us working, some of us in school was a, a pretty major adjustment for us. And one of the parts of our day that were particularly stressful was the morning time. It's kind of everyone trying to get ready for the day in the same way. Um, Miles is in this age where like there's some things that he's independent about, some things that he's not, and it was just something needed to change. We were having kind of stressful, chaotic mornings. Um, and so we had this theory, you know, we think that Miles can actually be more independent in the morning. If we get him some specific information that he doesn't need to get from us, he can make some decisions for himself. Um, maybe this will have kind of a broader impact on him in general, just kind of fostering his own independence and problem solving. Um, so we created a theory of action. We decided, all right, we are going to help him get the information he needs, make sure he knows what the weather is in the morning, make sure we set an alarm for him so he can wake up on his own. He has access to all the things he needs to get ready in the morning, toothbrush, change of clothes, um, his materials for the day. Um, but the goal would be he can do all of those things without us so that we can get little brother ready, we can get ourselves ready. And then in the, sh the short time that we have together in the morning, maybe it's more peaceful, we can enjoy each other, we can get him ready um, with more success for, for the day. So that was our theory of action. 
first we kind of had to, to check to see like, is this working? Does he actually get up with the alarm in the morning? Like we said, is he um, getting himself dressed as we planned? You know, as long as we make sure he knows what he needs to dress for, for the day, does he get his materials together? There's that fidelity kind of question that we needed to answer first. And then we had to pay attention to like, okay, but then is he actually getting ready? You know, how many mornings is he still coming to us and, and asking us questions and needing us to help him? Are we seeing early indicators that we're making some progress here? And then if, if the answer is yes, then it's kind of a evaluative standpoint. Are our mornings actually more peaceful? Is this happening? Do we see him being independent in other ways? Happy to report, you know, we're now what two thirds, maybe even three quarters of the way through the school year. And this has been a huge success. It's completely changed our life. Miles is um, getting ready by himself in the morning. Um, but the kind of moral of this story is we had to check those things along the way in order to make sure that this was working as intended. So just kind of putting this in a, a table format here so you can see it. Um, these were the decisions that we made. The results that we wanted to see early is that, you know, five days a week, he's getting himself ready on his own. And these were the outcomes that we measured. Is he being more independent? Are we seeing some more independent um, decisions from him? Is our time with him better quality in the morning? Absolutely. And have we kind of reduced the amount of chaos in the morning? Um, for sure, that has been something that we've been able to say yes to. So connecting this back to kind of your context then and what this might mean for you. Um, we put this table in here so that when you guys get these materials from us, this might be something you can walk through and either independently on your own, um, you're welcome to copy this table and kind of drop in examples of like your own programs or initiatives in your plan. Um, identify some like midterm results or uh, as we've as we've listed here, maybe you want to start with fidelity if you uh, if that is still a question for you. Um, or is it at the, are you at the point where you want to get some kind of like midterm project uh, checks here related to effectiveness? And then you may already have some outcome indicators that you identified when you, when you decided to, to put this program or initiative in your plan. If so, those will go on the right hand side. Um, one quick example that we, we added here is um, if your program or your initiative in your plan was to um, create stronger onboarding experiences for new teachers. And if the outcome on the other side of that, that was part of that um, theory of action is that this is gonna actually help us retain new teachers for the long term. The challenge there is, okay, what do you need to see in the middle that gives you a sense of this is actually working, we think we're still on the right track. One example might be you see higher satisfaction rates among teachers within their first year, possibly measured by, you know, a survey or employee engagement indicators or um, more qualitative data like uh, conversations that they have with their, their mentor teacher. Um, but again, the idea here is that you're thinking really intentionally around some midterms and progress measures and not just thinking um, from an evaluative standpoint. So we wanna take you through some more examples here. I'm gonna turn it back to Drea so she can walk you through some of these, but this is kind of getting to that last goal that we had for you guys today um, around being able to, to apply this to your own worlds. And I will also mention, if you're thinking of questions, save them. We're, Drea's gonna walk you through some examples here and then we'll also have plenty of time for some Q and A. Um, we'd be happy to do that. So be thinking about questions if you have them. Thanks Shelby. Um, so I, I might not get the saying exactly right, but Shelby always talks about this um, when we're thinking about data that often our districts are data rich but information poor. And I think, did I get that right? I think something like that. Okay, so, but I, I think that that is really highlighted here in prioritizing time for our teams to talk about data. And I know that we do this traditionally in many different ways. So um, we often have professional learning communities where teachers come together and talk about their own data. Um, and if there is a department or curriculum and instruction team that is thinking about, you know, implementations of different things, you're probably familiar with having data conversations. Um, but what we think about, um, or the addition that I think we add here is making time for teams to talk about data related to your strategic plan. And that's so important because it allows it, first of all, it makes sure that you're actually using the data that you're collecting. So there's a lot of 
um, information available that it really is about synthesizing and understanding um, what, where, what your current state is. And so I wanted to highlight some examples from a district um, and how they talk about data. So you can see two things here. Um, on the, on the left-hand side um, are some slides from when, uh, and this is a district in New Jersey. Um, you can see some examples of the decision-making that needed to happen as a result of COVID-19. So they knew that as they were opening for school, which I'm sure is similar for many of you, that you had to take a lot of information into consideration. Some of it was incomplete, some of it was um, highly helpful, um, but it also informed how you made your decisions. I think something that helped them um, in, in talking about this is they would, um, you can see on the top left, there is numbers of cases in their community. And then they talked about what the risks were of making decisions based off of the, the data that, that was coming in. So you can see on that slide, um, what were the, the disruptions uh, around um, the information that they had. So as a result, they were making decisions about whether to open or close, do hybrid learning or in-person learning based off of the information available to them by the CDC. Um, so this impacted staffing, it impacted um, needs for quarantines, how they hired, how they used their subs. Um, so what they did was they actively used the data that they had, and then they translated that into the decisions that they were making, and they were able to communicate that out to their community members. Um, <clears throat> the way this connects to their strategic plan is on the right, they, were, they had many different initiatives that they were hoping to kick off in 2020. And obviously those had to change as a result of um, you know, changing circumstances. But because they were actively looking at the information that they had, they were very clearly able to communicate and discuss, okay, are we still on track? Is this something that we wanna make sure that we're committed to do at this time? It doesn't mean that we're totally abandoning it, but it does mean that we're, we're making an active choice with the new information that we have. So because they had already had that space in their strategic planning process to talk about the data or talk about the information, it became less, uh, um, you know, the data is out there and we don't know what to do. And it became more of what information do we have and how can we use that to make our decision? So the more comfortable people get in doing that in a general strategic planning time, the more likely they're able to apply that when things are really high stakes as they were, um, you know, over the past year. Terea, do you mind if I add on to that before you switch? Um, I think this is a really critical point around these team conversations are really what are going to drive, you know, how much your your team does or doesn't look at data or use data. This, I think this is a question we get from leaders a lot, especially around our, our work and data culture is they'll come and say, you know, my people just don't look at the data. I give them these really fancy dashboards and, um, you know, they have access to all of this stuff. I've got all this cool data, but they just don't use it. Uh, and my response is always, how much are you asking about it? You know, how much do you talk about it in your team meetings? Because what you ask about is what they will prioritize. So if you start your meetings looking at the data together or start your meetings with a question about what's something you learned today or learned this week from XYZ report, if you ask about it, it will be prioritized and then it becomes habitual. It's something that they just um, build into their practice because they know you're going to ask about it. So I think this is a really good example, but so much of, of how much your, your teams and you individually will use information comes down to those habits that you build in your teams. Awesome, thank you, Shelby. Um, so uh, what I love about what Shelby was just saying is that you have to create the habit of talking about it so that it doesn't become intimidating. And I think a big part of that is working hard at creating psychological safety within your team. So this is a term that I think has become um, pretty popular as a result of the, the work by Amy Edmondson. Um, she defines psychological safety as a belief that one will not be punished or humiliated for speaking up with ideas, questions, concerns, or mistakes. And um, I wanna share a little bit about her research, but I also wanna share a bit about some, some examples that we've seen. 
So she studied different um, medical teams where they, to see, you know, who made more mistakes and um, who was more successful. And what they found was that there was a difference between um, teams that talked about their errors a lot versus teams that um, you know, didn't do it, didn't do it as much. So what they found was that when in teams with high psychological safety, they were talking about errors and problem solving along the way and building a lot of trust. Um, so the mistakes that they were making were a lot smaller and they were able to solve them together. Um, the alternatively, in teams where there was low psychological safety, they were not talking about errors and they would, you know, not question, like nurses would not question doctors or techs would not question doctors or nurses. And um, it led to more significant life-threatening errors because folks didn't feel comfortable in sharing or contradicting their colleagues. And I think this work is incredibly impactful. Obviously it has a um, very severe impact in the medical field, but I think this happens in education as well. So we have to, we can't just hope that psychological safety will happen. We have to really intentionally build that. Um, and the way that you can do that are these three steps, um, and I'll break them down a bit as well. So framing work as a learning problem. So rather than saying, um, you know, this is a problem that we need to solve and there's, we can't fail. Um, it's actually switching it and, and saying, you know, we haven't been here before. Um, we can't know what's going to happen and we need everybody to help us. And I think that um, it, something like this, the pandemic has actually made that more true for teams. Um, so while it's been incredibly devastating and a difficult time for all of us, I think that it has forced a lot of us to admit, hey, we've never been here before. And what we need to do moving forward is learn together and make sure that we're um, actively seeking each other's uh, insights and thoughts and feedback. And I think that that's something um, that teams with high psychological safety have been able to iterate and change quickly um, rather than, uh, you know, when there's low psychological safety where we're trying to stick to a, an original plan. Um, the next thing is acknowledging your own fallibility. And I think this is important for leaders. So as you're thinking about building psychologically safe teams who uh, uh, talk about data or talk about, um, you know, errors that they're making along the way, uh, being able to say in I don't have the entire picture and I need your support, I need to hear from you, will help people highlight that. Um, as it relates to uh, you know, data and how we interpret it ourselves, think about, um, there are many times when I look at data, I know that when we do work with, with school districts, I often look for um, difference in opinions between what teachers and leaders say. And that's just something that I really care about and I tend to look for that. Um, and that's a great perspective to have, but it's not the only perspective. My colleague often looks at the strength over time and seeing you know, what has changed since the last time we ran the survey or the last time we um, observed a classroom. And both perspectives are incredibly important and together they can create a more complete picture or a more complete story. Um, but if we don't have the space to talk about that and to think about our different preferences and um, acknowledge our biases, then we're not really going to be able to build a, a community where we're psychologically safe. Um, and then the last piece is modeling curiosity. So a few different things, and I'm going to share another example, but I do want to break these down individually, is um, being able to say, you know, I'm learning and this is how uh, I'm adapting along the way. Um, Often uh, our CEO, Anthony Kim, I think does this very well. He models his own learning, um, even by sharing silly things like um, uh, he, at the beginning of the pandemic, he was trying to get better at jump roping. And he put on Twitter, I'm uh, here I am. This is my, my current uh, skill that I'm trying to develop, you know, to, to maintain sanity while quarantining in an apartment. And um, he would post different uh, progress videos along the way to show you know, how he was improving. And you can see a significant difference in his style. And even in retrospect, you look back and say, oh, wow, you really needed to work on that. And being able to model and share that I, you know, I need to learn and I am actively learning and I'm going to put myself in the position to show you that I'm not an expert 
goes a really long way for other people to feel that they can do the same. So as a leader, I think these are all really important steps for you to consider to take um, and, and, and learn from um, and you know take back to your team. Um, the last anecdote I wanna share is about a community forum that Shelby and I were uh, in recently where um, we were asked to come and speak to the Spanish speaking community about their strategic planning initiative. And um, it was a, uh, it was led completely in Spanish and um, we translated all of the important information that the community had been also communicating in English. Um, and but created a really intentional space for folks to build that psychological safety. So we framed the strategic plan as a learning problem and had folks share, you know, what do you love about your community? What are some things you want to make sure we avoid? What are some things that are challenging that you want to make sure we address? And um, I was really struck by the superintendent who eventually, you know, he, he doesn't speak Spanish. That's why he'd asked us to come and translate. Um, and he uh, modeled the vulnerability and fallibility, stood up and said, you know, this is incredibly important to me. I am continuing to learn, but just know that your community is a priority for me. And I wanna make sure that I understand your needs. Um, and I think in that moment, he created a community where we could talk about that more. And I think he, he signaled both to the, to the parents and to his staff that this was going to be important. Um, so through that, they kind of set the, the foundation to have ongoing conversations. So I think down the line, there could potentially be, you know, this is what I heard and this is what we're hearing as a result of some of the changes that we've made. So um, just a few tips for how to continue to build psychological safety, because, you know, the data is just as is important, but it, it really you can't get to the core of the challenges or the the um, problem solving without building the psychological safety piece. Yeah, I agree, Drea. And I'm glad we're spending more time on this one, because I think, you know, going back to the point of how the difference between the traditional role in strategic or of data and strategic planning and a more responsive role for data, it all comes down to this, right? It all comes down to feeling safe enough to have these, these conversations in the middle of, is this working? Um, one of the things we talk a lot about in our data culture work is that, you know, you shouldn't evaluate your team based on what the data say, but rather based on their use of the information. Right. So rather, again, from like an evaluative standpoint of do these indicators say you're doing a good job or not? It's more, are you using this information to continually improve and grow your practice? Um, I love like this is less of a specific example than the one that, that Drea just uh, gave, but kind of going back to that uh, example of building in like personalized learning strategies as part of your strategic plan. I I can recall a conversation where it was more like a fidelity conversation with the teacher. So we decided we're gonna get more personalized um, in our instructional practices in your classroom. Is that happening? And she could go to her data and say, you know, I said I was gonna do targeted instruction with small groups four days a week, but I'm only doing it two days a week. That's something that I can improve on. So there was this ability, and, and she was praised for that. That was like something she got a lot of support for. She used the data to identify a way that she could implement this strategy with more fidelity, rather than waiting a year, going back and looking at her kids, like, um, you know, summative test data and say, you did a good job or you didn't. Um, so anyway, I think this, this point is, is critically important to being able to use data in a responsive way. So thanks for talking us through it, Dave, uh, Drea. Yeah. Thanks, Shelby. Um, so we've been kind of talking about what happens when plans are underway and what you want to take on um, as you're building those teams, as you're monitoring the plan. I think um, often the, the shift that we see when we go from traditional planning to responsive planning is um, really working on the not being attached to the outcome as, or not being attached to only one way to reaching the outcome. And I think Shelby talked about this a lot too, is when we have those middle indicators, we're able to shift and adapt. And we know that our plan is meant to change. 
um, but that we are incredibly motivated by the process or by the, um, the experience that this has had within the community. And so another thing I wanna share is um, in order to establish that your plan is meant to change, you have to really build a, um, a culture of trust and a culture of feedback loop and sharing. Um, and it's it's interesting, I was recently on another webinar that I was listening to, so I don't know if anybody was on that one too, you'll know it if, um, but they were talking about how trust is essentially following through on your promises. And the more that you are able to, um, to build opportunities to seek feedback, but to also explain what you're going to do with it and how it's going to change your practice. That's a huge um, way to build trust and improve the culture within your organization. So I wanna talk a bit again about South Brunswick and how we saw them do this um, with a, developing ongoing feedback. So in their initial plan, they did a lot of engagement throughout the creation of their strategic plan. So they had um, empathy interviews, we had a, a huge number of surveys as indicated by that um, graph, the circular graph. Um, there were forums for families. And then the bottom left picture is actually a problem solving session that they led. So they said, okay, you gave us this feedback that these are the four areas we really need to work on. We obviously have some ideas, but we'd rather hear from you. What is your feedback? What are your ideas for what you'd like to see? So as a result, the community provided ideas and those became things that they um, incorporated into their strategic plan. Um, and so they developed their plan in, in early 2019. Um, so as you can imagine, the COVID-19 obviously adapted their, their plan or made, forced them to adapt their plan. Um, and obviously we're using this example, but I think this could be true in any year. This year obviously was one that really rocked our plans and made us think in very creative ways. Um, but they use the same um, avenues that they use in their initial strategic planning process to continue to get information um, and leverage feedback for um, adapting their, their um, plan. So again, back to using the local data that they had, they talked about positive cases, they shared um, ongoing information about the staff that were quarantined, um, students uh, going in hybrid and virtual, and they talked about, you know, the positive cases that we mentioned earlier, and they used the avenues that they had created before to share this information, highlight decision making, and ask for feedback um, um, for how families and communities wanted to see um, the adaptation and the support. Um, so, rather than having in-person forums, which I know the pictures on the left are like from another era, um, but they started leading um, virtual forums. So they brought families together to talk about, hey, this is the information that we have right now. These are the decisions that we're thinking about. What do you think? How does this make you feel um, about sending your child to school? Um, what does that make you think about uh, alternative creative ways that we can make sure that we're giving your student and you what you need. Um, there were surveys throughout. So they started to do more pulse check surveys rather than lengthy ones to get information throughout the week about, um, you know, community members comfort with sending their students back in person and um, the support that they were getting from their students teachers. So along the way, they were collecting small bits of information that would help them adapt their decision. I think another astute decision that they made was not, make, not asking questions that they didn't think would help them make, uh, make a decision. So they were very clear on, this is the information that I need to make an informed decision. And as a result, that's the information I'm going to ask for. Um, so I think that uh, the creating your strategic plan in a responsive way really lends itself to being adapted and to changing. And um, the data is critical in, to, in being able to do that. Um, so I'll pause here. I don't know, uh, Shelby, if you have anything you wanted to add. Yeah, just one quick thing. I, I we're, we probably belabor, belabored the um, kind of COVID application here, but it, it's worth, um, to borrow your phrase, worth underscoring because I think we saw really great examples of, of teams and schools and districts doing this 
whenever they were responding to COVID. So in particular, when they were converting to virtual instruction or hybrid instruction. And I think it was because this kind of, this acknowledgement that we weren't really sure how to do it. You know, we had some ideas, we put some plans in place, but then we really wanted feedback around, is this working? I saw some really great student surveys. I saw really wonderful kind of like teacher conferences happening with kids to ask them, is this working for you? How can this be better? Some really interesting um, like parent conversations around like, what do you need to support your child's learning? Um, there seemed to be some really strong efforts in ways that I hadn't seen before to collect data as they went. But again, because they were coming from this place of like, we're not really sure if we're doing this right. I almost wish we could bottle that up, you know, and put it in a, a, a like typical strategic planning process, because usually that kind of uncertainty or insecurity doesn't exist. And I think that's what prevents us from continuing to ask for feedback. It's this more like, we know how to do this. We're pretty sure we know it's going to happen. And in most places, in most cases, that's true. Um, but the power of getting the feedback along the way and uncovering those perspectives that you might not know or um, um, you may not have insight to, it's just another way to make sure that what you have planned is actually going the way you intended and actually having the outcomes that you were hoping to see. Yeah, thanks, Shelby. And something to note about what we've highlighted here is that um, often the misconception about what data is is related strictly to academic achievement or what we're seeing in, in the classroom. And I think um, hopefully these examples have highlighted that data is everywhere. The information that you're looking for is truly, um, you know, in, in different, different indicators. And it really uh, forces us to think really critically about what information do we want? Um, so I'm gonna pause here. I'll ask Shelby a few questions as we prepare, but um, please feel free. We're gonna go into the Q&A portion. We wanted to save about 10 minutes for that um, to share some updates, um, but then also make sure we made some time for you all to ask your questions. It looks like Rui is already asking one. Um, so. Feel free to add in the chat or in the Q&A function. Um, the question from Rui is, the traditional strategic plan is a document or text. Is this still the best format? Um, and how often do we need to pivot? Great question. Um, I, I'll share my thoughts and then Shelby maybe can share yours as well. Um, something that we do in strategic planning is making sure that everybody understands the components of their plan and why they exist. So. Um, if you're going to have a vision, which we do think is a good practice or best practice, we want you to know what the vision is meant to do and why you have it, and then um, and then make sure you include it. If you want to have priorities, um, why do you want to have priorities? Do you want priorities or do you want goals or do you want beliefs or do you want aspirations? What are the different things that will help you motivate um, the plan? So I, I think that's the first step is thinking about what information do you want to include in the plan? Um, and then what's the format? So I think for us, we do a document that, um, you know, is an external facing document that doesn't change that is meant to show the, the high level important um, points and key points of your plan. Um, but it can be in slides, it can be in a PDF, it can live on a website. So whatever format helps communicate that, um, I think is best. So, um, I guess to answer your question, I would say, sure, writing it down is important, but I think the most important thing is that it's accessible by your stakeholders and your community. Yeah, I agree, Jerry. Accessibility is really important. I would also say I wouldn't communicate it in a way that makes you feel like you can't change it. You know, there are going to be parts of your, like, we oftentimes when we define a vision, uh, or I'm sorry, when we define a pivot, it's like a, a change in strategy without a change in vision. So like the overall vision, what we're trying to accomplish is the same, like that's core, that's gonna, it's our shared purpose. It, we're gonna stay consistent around that. But the ways in which we try to reach that vision or, the, or that shared purpose, they may change as our environment changes. And so when you think about kind of like the really, you know, polished, um, visual, like strong representation you put on your website, maybe you print it out in a big poster and hang it in your district office. I would include the core components that 
don't need to be able to change and respond. Otherwise, it sounds silly, but I think a lot of people get emotionally connected to that content because you've invested so much in communicating it out. And now even when you hit a roadblock and feel like, ooh, that might need to change now, there's this hesitation because then it's like, well, we've got to redo our posters, you know? And so I think having a high level to Drea's point, like have your really your core mission there, have your priority areas that you know are, are gonna stay true, but maybe don't go into so much detail in and how like in that formal representation that it it becomes a barrier in your ability to like adapt that as you go. I think that would that'd be the balance I'd try to strike. Shelby. Mm -hmm. Now, please feel free to uh, add any more questions to the chat. Um, a question I have for you, Shelby, is um, what, what if any, do you have any examples of like creative use of data or, you know, untraditional uh, types of data that people have used to help make their decisions? Yeah, I can think of two. One is very COVID specific, but it was such a like, you know, eye opening moment that I'm thinking, okay, what is like post pandemic our example going to be but um, one of the really, you know, we I love this um, matrices that we started using in our data culture work where it was like the data that we decide to collect and the data we decide to use. So you'll have like information that you invest a lot of energy around collecting and a lot of resources around collecting, um, but you may not use it, right? Or you have information that you kind of need a lot, but you haven't invested a lot in kind of collecting that. So they, your, your data points can, can kind of fall all over that matrices. But in, in one of our exercises of brainstorming, like what kind of information falls in these, I had a district say, um, you know, we information that we need a lot that we don't have is um, the like bandwidth that all of our virtual platforms are using. You know, we had this huge initiative where we distributed all of these um, hotspots out to our community to help kids get access to online instruction, but some of them are draining really quickly and we don't know why. And we think it's because some programs use a disproportionate amount of bandwidth and we've got to figure that out. And that's information you kind of never would have thought to collect. Um, and again, a very kind of like pandemic schooling example, but um, I think why that example keeps sticking with me is that until we ask the right questions, we're not going to know the kind of data that we need. And, and I think there's often um, a disconnect between like the decisions that are made around what data are important and the questions that are being asked by like end users over here, you know, so um, I'm not sure if this answers your question, but I think that like the theme that came out of a lot of that is we've got to back to team conversations. Like there's got to be these team habits where we're asking the questions and then making decisions about data to collect that are that are connected to those. Um, there was another, I told you I had two examples and now the other one is escaping me. Um, I don't know. Well, maybe, while you think about that, I'd, I'd love to comment on that because I, yeah, I think there's something important there to highlight is that I think we often <clears throat> get into the habit of collecting things and saying, okay, we need reading levels, we need this type of information. And we don't necessarily say like, what question is that meant to ask? And that when you have a team actively saying, you know, we need to know more about bandwidth or we need to know more about um, uh, supporting families at home while they're, while they're, you know, whether it's in the pandemic or otherwise, um, how can they support their student? It's like, you have to ask the question first and then you have to attach the, the data that you need to collect. So I appreciate that about, about your story too. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I thought of my other example really quick. I know we're, we're about out on time and this is not a new idea, but I think it's worth like re-emphasizing because I've seen it more and more is this idea of student-led conferencing and student-led conferencing that's done so with data. Um, this is again, kind of borrowing from our data culture work. We talk a lot about the end user. And, and I think there's these assumptions that your end user of data is um, the school leader or maybe even the teacher when really we want it to be the student, right? We, we want data to be something that we, not that we collect so that we can do for, 
but that we collect so that we can do with. And I think these examples of using data for student-led conferencing are, are really powerful to see how um, you know, students are, are using their own information to make their own um, decisions about kind of their learning going forward and the power or the learning that happens for both parents and teachers in those conversations about, you know, how those, the dialogue that happens there. Um, and I think this connects back to this whole strategic plan conversation because it goes back to the power of feedback where, you know, these conversations around like how it's going and these progress measures is not something you just do in central office. You know, these are data conversations to have with everyone who is, who is involved, um, I think with the initiatives in your plan. Yeah, I love that. Um, and, and kind of inspired by that, I think um, that we have a great resource if you're interested in thinking more about um, building a data culture. So kind of what Shelby talked about in um, uh, designing for the end user or incorporating a team. Um, and we highly encourage you to download our, uh, our guide for good measure authored by Shelby herself um, and a few other teammates, but a really great resource to start thinking about um, I love the the twist to culture and thinking about how do we make this a part of our fiber and how we continue to talk about it. So highly encourage you to do that. Um, this was a part of our webinar series for learning now and planning for next year. Um, so for 21 and 22. And uh, so, oh, sorry, that that series is upcoming, but this is leading into that. So in April and May, we're going to be exploring what are we doing next? What are we thinking about for the upcoming school year? So highly encourage you to, to join us for those events that are going to be upcoming. Um, same place that you found this one on our events, um, virtual events on our website. Um, and then another uh, virtual event that I wanted to highlight was the systems level approach to schooling loss. So a lot of people um, have been talking about, and I know the term has varied, um, the idea of learning loss, schooling loss, learning recovery, um, but thinking about what are we gonna do with the information that we have about our students? How are we gonna make sure we're meeting their social, emotional, and academic needs as they um, head into the next school year um, after a pretty, disruptive year and a half. Um, so if you're interested in learning a bit more about this and engaging in a conversation, um, that event will be on April 13th. And then finally, if you wanna to continue to, to learn from us, please follow us on social media. You can follow our blog. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and um, YouTube. And you will receive these slides and the recording of this webinar um, tomorrow. So thank you all so much for joining. Uh, this was a great conversation and we look forward to, to connecting with you um, ongoing. So thanks everyone. Bye, thank you.